back with that uh, Marshall DSL 100 and uh, as I went to put it back together or I started the process rather I noticed this the bias pins had all broken free of their solder joints here so kind of get those back to where they began they're not really crucial if they break the app still operates um, and I don't use them when I bias one of these things but it's nice to have everything in an amp solid, and someone may try to use these someday. So you don't want to have any false resistance readings at these pins. Sorry if my voice sounds a little bit odd as I get closer to the uh, camera. I'm leaning over to do this. I will soon have a uh, lavalier mic, so my voice will not uh, be changing level and sound as I move around so much. Okay, that's that. Let me just add some solder to these trim pot connections. Those are crucial to the operation of the amp. And let me just shore up the connections on this header. One last thing to point out on the original board. I don't know whether this was a schematic slash design mistake or whether this board was mispopulated. They made so many changes on these DSL and TSL boards um, that it's hard to know what was an intentional mistake, what was... Uh, a mistake of alleged design and what was just a manufacturing error but on this original board all the grid stoppers on the output tubes are 220 K's which is uh, not a really good sound at least not a traditional sound it's not necessary they have 220 K grid leaks which makes sense but uh, you know 220 K is an awful lot to put there on the new board, those 220Ks have magically transformed themselves to uh, 5.6Ks, which is the more traditional Marshall EL84 EL value. So who can know what happened in the dim recesses of time when this thing was designed, or whatever it was that they called it. This one watt uh, resistor here has got some scorching on it. But that's no longer our problem because this whole board is going away. Now, something I want to show on this is, uh, let me get this to focus. The solder joints on this big rectifier bridge have been reworked, and there's some evidence of heat there. You can see some discoloration there. And that happens because these have uh, a good bit of current which turns into a good bit of heat and it's right up against the board and eventually this will roast the board and uh, damage the traces. It happens quite a bit in Marshalls. JCM 900s have this issue. JCM 800s in the late 80s can have this issue. Anytime you have a rectifier bridge like this, it is good to mount it above the board for some airflow, but the machines which place these components can only place things up against boards. Not very accurately, as you can tell, but they cannot elevate it by X amount. And so this new board has the exact same thing. Um, it's also not great that they have this thing which can get very warm right next to a capacitor, which does not like heat. So uh, I've got this new 8 amp bridge. And I'm going to fix this problem before it becomes a problem in this new board before I even put it in the amp. Much better. Even at that roughly half an inch, 12 millimeters doesn't seem like a lot. That is an exponentially uh, better way to keep this thing running cool. This will run so much cooler with this longer lead length and better airflow. It's less likely to bake this cap because it, it itself will not get as hot and these traces on the bottom are much li less likely to get damaged um, through continued use. 
So I think I'm ready to put this back in place. And then I'll show you some things to check on the output board. And then we'll check the preamp board. I'll get these fuses put, in, put back, get this in place, and see where we're at. Okay, the new board's in place. Because uh, I've bent up things that kind of came, got pressed on in the process. My new board's in place. All the wires reconnected where they go. Yeah, the spaghetti is Marshall's, not mine. So all of now, let's put everything back together, put in the tubes, and send it home, right? Aha, uh -huh, nice try, Marshall. But I'm on to your tricks. The DSL boards and the TSL boards have a lot of very common issues. This is the impedance selector switch. The impedance selector switch uh, has broken solder joints, which is not good for the output transformer. And uh, only half the switch is being used, which is not fantastic in terms of the current capabilities of the switch. So I'm going to bridge these so the switch uh, current uh, handling capacity will be doubled. The output jacks need a little bit of solder reflowing, but here's a crucial thing that affects these so much. Later revisions fix this. The, these are the, uh, oops. Four and eight ohm output. So this is the 16 ohm output. And notice that the ground trace disappears here. They were trusting that if you plugged into the uh, 16 ohm, that it would disconnect the taps for the eight or four, which is fine to do on the positive, but they did that on the negative. And so no matter which tap you're using, the negative always goes through the very thin metal of the jack for its negative. And these often burn up and fail. You're also trusting that the contacts will be clean. So I'll put in some heavy gauge bus wire to bridge that negative and take out a common point of failure in this app. You can see some solder joints there on those resistors aren't too happy. Sorry about the camera work. It's hard to do this one-handed. The uh, effects return jack, let me get this to focus. Effects return jack has broken solder joints. The send jack is about the same. These jacks are just kind of ugly, and there's been some kind of, it looks like a liquid spill. I'll clean all that up, and uh, I'll have to look at every other little solder joint on here. Make sure it's solid before I put this back together. Little solder joints on that switch don't look too good either. So I've got a little bit of soldering to do, and I'll get back to you. All right, now that's going to be much more solid. The sad thing, I need to remove a little bit more flux there, but the sad thing here is that all this was easily preventable if someone who actually knew what they were doing had designed this the first time. My personal belief, which I've come to after doing this for a long time and seeing every stupid way that amps fail, is that no one who designs amps for a major company has any business doing that job until they have repaired a few thousand amps. Even more important than what to do is what not to do. And this amp is just chock full of what not to do's. Um, someday I'll do a rant on that whole subject. Or basically, um, people who have experience in actually doing the amps may not have the electrical engineering degree. And the companies only hire people with electrical engineering degrees to do this stuff. And a lot of those guys have no idea what fuel conditions are. And a separate rant is that anyone with electrical engineering degree in 2021, who's actually really damn good, well, there's a lot of money to be made in telecommunications and such. Whereas this stuff, hasn't changed all that much since the 40s. You know, Leo and those guys were all coming out of radio repair. They knew um, tubes and how tubes and analog circuits worked, but more importantly, they'd repaired a bunch of stuff. Leo started out as, an, as a radio repairman. So, 
the electrical engineers that the companies hire in my less than charitable moments, I don't think are the best and brightest. I'm pretty sure that Google and Cisco, etc., snatch those guys up. And, uh, you know, another rant for another day will be all these new digital powered switching circuit amps, like the new Fender, what they call them, Tone Masters, some nonsense like that. For now, I'll just say, is anyone out there still enjoying their Cyber Twin? Anyone out there jamming hard every night on a Line 6 Spider? The era of disposable amps is upon us. And the reviewers and the magazines and such are not qualified to review the boxes that they are sent. Anyway, enough of that. Now i got to do some more stuff on the preamp board before I put all this back together. Okay, the preamp board. More of that lovely spill type substance. Some broken solder joints there. I'm not going to go too slow on this. I see a lot of solder joints that need a little extra leaven. Sure, the pots need to be cleaned as well. Some heat's been in this area, it looks like. I need to examine that. There may just be discoloration from components on the other side showing through. And uh, the input jack. It's got some solder joints that are breaking. It's really hard to get this to focus on this. The uh, phone camera lens does not like focusing on shiny things. Anyway, there's a lot more to this than just swapping out the board. So, I'll get this thing working right. After all of that, uh, the amp had come in with some mismatched old power tubes that had bad scorch marks. Uh, those are trashed. It's got a new match quad of Mullard EL34s in there. I really like those as far as current production EL34s go. They've been very reliable and they sound very good. Um, I got it all biased, which is a pain in the butt with this circuit because it has different biases for each side, which would not be a problem except the trim pots that they use are very flimsy. Uh, it's hard to reach the spots I like to reach when I bias these amps just because of where the output board is. And uh, if you adjust one side, the other one changes as well because it wasn't the best design that they could have done for a dual bias. Not that I find it set necessary. All right, so got all that set. Uh, I'm gonna have to let the amp run for a couple hours before I decide it's good because what if the bias starts to change? This model can do that, notorious for that. The new board is supposed to fix that. Let me make sure. It had one really uh, noisy tube in, in the phase inverter. That's gone. I moved the old tubes down one and put a tongue saw 12VX7 and V1. Here's the clean. And the dirt. So, uh, it's working. The pots are all quiet. No scratchiness. Um, everything seems to be very normal. But like I said, I need to let that bias run for a couple hours and get everything hot and make sure that everything stays stable. Then I got to put these wires back where they used to be and neaten things up and put all the front uh, panel hardware back in place. Then do a real playing test once I'm sure that the amp is going to be stable in use.